really go into it with your full strength of imagination and find out whether that's where you want to be. You will soon see that's not what you want. I will promise you this, that if we have not gotten our troops out by the time I am president, it is the first thing I will do. I will get our troops home. We will bring an end to this war. You can take that to the bank. Well, President Obama has ordered 17,000 more American troops to Afghanistan. It's the first stage of a build-up that will eventually see 60,000 U.S. troops deployed to the country. The U.S. president has revealed his plan for Afghanistan, escalating the war at the fastest possible pace. It is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. When I was in Iraq, I saw the devastation that our invasion and occupation had met out upon the Iraqi people. I saw and at times participated in the dehumanization and de degradation of the Iraqi people by robbing others of their inherent dignity, by denying them respect, and by treating them as a less than human other. We ultimately robbed ourselves of our own dignity, humanity, and compassion. You roll into Baghdad, written by Carlos Marighella a former leader of the Communist Party of Brazil. The mini-manual gives complete instructions on every aspect of weaponry, deployment of forces, and the use of terrorism. And then it says, the government has no alternative except to intensify repression. The police roundups. Hard enough. But as this moment, right now, now you're talking about putting me on a barge. Gwendolyn Donahue is not happy with the temporary housing coming to Port Arthur. She was rescued from her home during Harvey in his... Let's go back, because we know. We know exactly what that is. That's a prison. That's a FEMA prison on a damn barge. You go in there, you ain't coming out. They get you out to sea, and then you start to find, they're going to throw your ass over like you was walking the plank. Do not get on none of them fucking barges. If it gonna go to no FEMA camps, they're gonna kill you. Don't go. We need to make an uproar about this and share it worldwide. Keep sharing it. Because you think they're only gonna do it here? Uh-uh. They're, they're gonna be doing this all over the country, everywhere, all over the world. Not just the United States. Home during Harvey and is currently staying at the Red Cross shelter at the Thomas Jefferson Middle School. The next place she lives could look like this. It's a barge and FEMA is providing two of these that will hold about 300 people each on the port of Port Arthur. But I say again, I'm not a fish. I'm not a crab. I'm not a shrimp. Because I don't know nothing about being on a boat. Mayor Freeman says the barges are expected to arrive in two days, but County Judge Jeff Brannock says other options are being looked at. This is what they think about humanity. This is what they think about people. They never gave a fuck about the people. They've been thinking or are plotting on this agenda for a very long time. All of them jade hell drills, uh, martial law drills. I mean... The guy's way too long, it's going to be too late, and we're all going to be fighting to, to save our lives, our kids' life. You guys better wake up. It's not back into reality. Shit ain't sweet. It ain't sweet at all. And when they get done with all these puppets, because that's what these motherfuckers right here is, he's a fucking puppet. When they get done with all these puppets, they'll be gone too as well. FEMA and the Texas Division of Emergency Management will give options like mobile homes, trailers, and shelters. So look, F, Fraud Emergency Man Management Agency. That's what they are. It's a fraud Emergency Management Agency.
Other displaced residents like Patricia Mooney say they would not mind staying on a barge. Nice place, you know, to regroup, you know, get yourself together, you know. Come on, that's a fucking prison. You must be a paid opposition to say some shit like that. Don't nobody want to go to jail or nobody want to be in prison. You can't possibly tell me that you are okay with going to prison. You know, you ain't even done nothing go, so why would you, you gonna send yourself to prison? Who the fuck does that? <laughs> Give it a try. Well, no less you try. Mayor Freeman says three meals a day will be offered at the barges along with lawn. Three meals a day and uh, also with your laundry. Yep, that's prison. That's jail. The three meals a day and they'll give you their, uh, do your laundry. And it's gonna be some stripes. It ain't gonna be your day clothes. Or your outside clothes, your street clothes. Street and satellite TV. Officials are oh, all. Oh, they got satellite TV. Man, fuck that satellite TV. Everything on that damn TV is fake. They ain't gonna show you no real shit. They ain't gonna show you why you being distracted and watching the fake shit. They gonna be doing what they've been doing. How you think they got away with it th all this time? Because they have distracted the mass people. They have distracted them with. Anything that they can possibly get them to divert their attention to, no matter what it is, and that's exactly what they've done. Call it slipping. Also looking into separating the men and women inside, and we'll also have security. In so now you're going to be separated from your loved one. So if you have a wife or you have a husband and you have kids, my question is, what are they going to do with your kids? Where's your kids going to go? You're going to put your fucking kids on that? You're going to allow them to uh, take your kids? Force you to, to take your kids on there? No. You won't be taking your kids. And you ain't coming off that motherfucking barge. House searches. <laughs> They tweaking, they ain't got no warrant to kick in here. They ain't got no warrant to kick in here. They ain't got no warrant for the bitch. unjust, incapable of solving problems, and resorts purely and simply to the physical liquidation of its opponents. The urban guerrilla must become more aggressive and violent, resorting without let-up to sabotage, terrorism, expropriations, assaults, kidnappings, and executions, heightening the disastrous situation in which the government must act. This same strategy was expressed in 1968 by Italian communist Gian Giacomo Feltrinelli, famous millionaire publisher of the novel Dr. Zhivago. In a booklet entitled Political Guerrilla Warfare, Feltrinelli said that the task of the terrorist was, and these are his words, to violate the law openly, challenging and outraging institutions and public order in every way. Then when the state intervenes as a result with police and the courts, it will be easy to denounce its harshness and repressive dictatorial tendencies. 
In Germany, Erlichi Meinhof of the Red Army Fraction explained it this way. She said, It is necessary to provoke the latent fascism in society, and then the people will turn to us for leadership. In 1970, Kent State had become the object of an intensive organizational drive on behalf of the Weatherman faction of the SDS. For over two years, a steady stream of professional revolutionaries appeared before student groups. Weatherman Bernadine Dorn told them that there soon would be shooting on campus and admonished them to arm themselves for rebellion. A single big apartment building is blown up. Every single apartment building in Baghdad has been broken to the ground by artillery and airplanes bombing. You cannot meet someone in Iraq who has not lost a family member. Could you imagine what we had done in America if in 9-11 everybody in America lost a family member? What would we be doing? Would we be talking about war? No, we'd be in the streets with weapons. And so people talk about, oh, these people killing American soldiers in Iraq, they're terrorists. Not terrorists, they're wearing sandals. And they got an AK. And they got 14-year-old boys building bombs to kill these American soldiers because we killed their family. People just don't wake up and want to go kill people. I was ordered multiple times by commissioned officers and non-commissioned officers to shoot unarmed civilians if their presence made me feel uncomfortable. The primary loyalty is not to democracy or to the flag or to America or to the Iraqi people or to the rule of law. It is to each other's safety at the expense of everything else. There is a cost to this war and this cost is being paid in American blood in my soldier's blood, and that is not okay. From my perspective, it didn't seem to, to make any sense what we did. We didn't accomplish anything. A few months after it was there, I mean, a lot of things weren't sitting right with me. The the the, the command structure, the, the missions that we were getting didn't make any sense. We we're going after people, Mujahideen or Muj, and um, they didn't have any idea which ones were the right ones, were kicking in the wrong doors, terrifying children. Helicopters scream uh, over their heads at night, and I was trying to calm the women and children while the men were dragged and separated out and uh, completely humiliated in front of their families. 9-11 was a lie. I know it. We're soldiers. We know it. And on March 21st of 2003, my military service was hijacked in an unconstitutional order to invade the sovereign nation of Iraq. This is a slap in the face to every service member who feels used because he was told he was going to go fight for his country and then was sent to go kick in the doors of innocent people unprovoked in the middle of the night to draw fire into their house so that we might have somebody to shoot back at. If the media was not biased, this film would be shown here so that you could then make a decision. Show them both sides of the story and then let the human being make the decision whether they want their kids there or not. Don't show me one side and say it's patriotism, it's courageous. Nothing I did in Iraq was courageous. I brought fear into people's homes. I traveled with a 50 caliber weapon every single day and slept with a pistol underneath my pillow. Tell me what is so courageous about that. And I tried hard to be proud of my service, but all I could feel was shame. And racism could no longer mask the reality of the occupation. These were people, these were human beings. I've since been plagued by guilt anytime I see an elderly man, like the one who couldn't walk, who he rolled onto his stretcher and told the Iraqi police to take him away. I feel guilt anytime I see a mother with her children, like the one who cried hysterically and screamed that we are worse than Saddam as we forced her from her home. I feel guilt anytime I see a young girl, like the one I grabbed by the arm and dragged him to the street. We were told we were fighting terrorists. The real terrorist was me, and the real terrorism is this occupation. Funding the wars, killing the troops. I mean, it, if you really think about it, it, it's really, really blatantly obvious, and it's really stupid that we have to say this, but we do. We have to get down to basics. We have to break it down Barney style. When I joined the military, I raised my hand and said that I'll protect the Constitution of the United States and its people and against foreign and domestic enemies. But guess what? I did not raise my hand to protect private companies like KBR and put my life on the line so they can make a buck. When are we going to realize that people fighting in Iraq against us, they're not terrorists, they're soldiers. What will we do if somebody invaded us? I know I will pick up my weapon and fight against them. What the hell we call them? Terrorists? These people want their country back. Let's give them their country back. I won't even talk to politicians about the war. 
because there ain't no point in it. Democrat, Republican, they're all profiteers of war. Even lots of anti-war organizations are profiting off my brother's pain. I'm embarrassed at the state of politics in America that it's come to that. We have to talk to Congress like they're fucking children. We've got a responsibility to the honor of this country and to the honor of every man and woman who has served in Iraq and ever served in our military to not leave them with anything less than the honor that they deserve. Honor? Are you kidding me? You saying that it's an honor to die in Iraq and to fight a war that we started and we're in the wrong. You're going to tell me that it's an honor to serve in Iraq when private contractors get paid $100,000 plus and drive $60,000 vehicles inside the base while soldiers are outside the base rolling and patrolling and losing their lives. Is that honor? Are you kidding me? Those who send us to war do not have to pull a trigger or lob a mortar around. They do not have to fight the war. They merely have to sell the war. They need a public who is willing to send their soldiers into harm's way. They need soldiers who are willing to kill and be killed without question. They can spend millions on a single bomb, but that bomb only becomes a weapon when the ranks in the military are willing to follow orders to use it. They can send every last soldier anywhere on earth, but there will only be a war if soldiers are willing to fight. And the ruling class, the billionaires who profit from human suffering, care only about expanding their wealth, controlling the world economy understand that their power lies only in their ability to convince us that war, oppression, and exploitation is in our interest. Our freedom comes from ourselves, when we make the decision to speak our mind. This is well within the rights that service members have, but not very many service members know that they have. As soon as I got out of the military, I joined an organization called Iraq Veterans Against the War, which aside from calling for a full immediate withdrawal of all U.S. forces from Iraq, also calls for full support and benefits for returning veterans. We have members across the country and overseas, in Germany, in Iraq. Less than four years ago, there were seven of us, and today there are over 1,200. Our membership has more than doubled in the past year and is continuing to grow. So we do have a resistance movement. We do have dissent within the ranks. Uh, it's happening uh, for each one of us who goes public. There's probably a hundred, you know, who are resisting quietly. You know, let's be brutally honest. Our leaders aren't going to end the occupation. It's going to be us that ends the occupation. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think as a 24-year-old kid I should go to jail for not wanting to kill people. I had a personal experience after one of the talks that I did with, with a man. He, he came up to me after that and he told me he was an Iraqi man. And he said that he was from the area around Balad. And I was stationed in Balad. And I just, I, just, I just couldn't help it. Just all of a sudden I hugged the guy. And I said that I was sorry. That I was so sorry. And I ended up crying right there to this perfect stranger. And he told me it was okay. You know, he told me it was okay, and that that was that was redemption. To me, it's it's uh, this phenomenon that we're witnessing is actually a, a natural evolution. And any time you organize human beings to come together to use violence as a way of conflict resolution, you will have a breakdown of that organization. Peace is not a political process, and it's certainly not a militaristic process. I refuse to participate and the Iraq occupation. This will be done by them directly through the KGB, their secret police. Other times it's done through a group badly misnamed called the World Peace Council. and 
values is essential to achieve social, economic, and ecological well-being in the 21st century. The Commission plans to circulate the final version of the Charter as a People's Treaty beginning in mid-1998. The Charter will be submitted to the United Nations General Assembly in the year 2000, which has been done. They are now considering the Earth Charter for ratification. And there is a treaty that's awaiting in the wings of the IUCN called the Covenant on the Environment and Development that as soon as the United Nations accepts the Earth Charter will be brought out as an international treaty for the nations to sign that will put into legal force the various provisions of this particular creed. This has real world ramifications. The Bureau of Land Management, of which California has much, most of the eastern United States does not have any Bureau of Land Management land, but the western half of the United States does. In fact, the Bureau of Land Management controls most of western land. They came out in 1994, in March 30th of 94, with a plan called the Ecosystem Management. And in the chapter called the Human Dimensions of Ecosystem Management, the objective and purpose of that particular chapter states that all ecosystem management activities should consider human beings as a biological resource. In other words, you and I are nothing more than biological resources for these elite people in the Bureau of Land Management to manage. We have no more value than the rocks and the trees that they also manage. This right out of a government document. And needless to say, we took this to the U.S. Congress and it has created quite a stir back in 1994. That language is no longer in there. But the very fact that it was shows the mentality of these people. And that mentality was brought out very clearly this past year. The great fire season of the year 2000, in which we literally saw nearly seven million acres burn up, primarily in southern Idaho and Montana, but really all over the western United States. It was a bad fire year. We were going to have a lot of fires, a lot of major fires. The problem was that because of this belief system that permeates the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management now, many of these fires <coughs> The actual fire officials argued for as many as three days before they lifted the first shovel against those fires, whether or not they should send bulldozers in to build fire lines because they may rip out a plant or two of an endangered species. Three days. As this fire continues to burn, and the eeriest part about this is there is not a firefighter in sight. We have not heard a siren. We have not seen a fire truck. Nothing. And that is... Three days. ...to burn. And the eeriest part about this is there is not a firefighter in sight. We have not heard a siren. We have not seen a fire truck. Nothing. And that is exactly like what we've been talking about all morning. These firefighters are trying to save people's lives. And so now that they know that everyone has been evacuated from the Hilton Sonoma wine country, they know there's nothing they can do. It is just going to burn. <laughs> hospitals, nursing homes, and at least one resort. The smell of smoke is expected to hang over the whole Bay Area today. Evacuations have been ordered in Anaheim Hills because of a fast-moving brush fire. Anaheim Fire's Christina Hamm said... Council on Foreign Relations, many people think this is the boogeyman of, of the uh, secret societies of the 
of the globalists. It's not. It's a front group. About 800 people belong to it. Mostly it's a good old boys club. However, there is a core at the center of the, of the Council on Foreign Relations that is very active in promoting world government and is using the whole CFR apparatus, as it were, as a smokescreen. And they publish, usually in their, their publication called Foreign Affairs, those kinds of thinking that they're right ready to institute in the world. And this one happens to be done in, the, in 1970, just three years after the publication of the Iron Mountain Report, which calls for, if we're going to create a world government, we can no longer use war as a mechanism to cause fear amongst populations and therefore allow us to control the behavior of populations through fear. We have to find an alternative, and the Iron Mountain Report, named after the first meeting held in Iron Mountain, New York, along the Hudson River and those uh, nuclear bunkers built into the mountainside there, where they actually have defined what it was that they wanted to substitute the threat of war for in order to be able to control populations. And they settled on in 1967 in their publication called the Iron Mountain Report, the Environmental Holocaust. Years after that publication, foreign relations began to publish a series of articles describing the ecological holocaust that was facing the world. This document, the Global Biodiversity Assessment, states that the population growth has exceeded the capacity of the Earth's biosphere to support us. They give two solutions, and only two, to this problem. The first is that it's estimated that an agricultural world in which most human beings are peasants should be able to support five to seven billion people. Well, folks, we have six billion people right now. That means all of us in this room, or nearly all of us in this room, are going to have to become agrarian peasants if we use this solution. Do you want to become an agrarian peasant? Do you want to live in a metal shack someplace with a dirt floor, maybe a bed or two? Do you want to have them tell you how many kids you could have? Because this is exactly what they have in mind. This is their solution. This isn't mine. I didn't use the word peasants. They used the word peasants. Now, not too many of us are too wild about that particular option, are we? They give you a different option. In contrast, they go on to say, a reasonable estimate for an industrialized world society at the present North American material standard of living would be one billion people. So if we wanted to maintain our current standard of living, we would have to reduce the Earth's human population by somewhere around 70% in the next 30 to 50 years, according to this document. While he left Hear that move forward with some of his agenda. That they are well equipped to do. You know, it, it's an obvious man-made, I mean, not, not man-made, natural, incredible disaster that Texas is dealing with. It, it, it's an obvious man-made, I mean, not, not man-made, natural, incredible disaster that Texas is dealing with. It, it, it's an obvious man-made, I mean, not... published on June 2nd, 2015. CBS this morning uploads storm simulator recreates category five hurricane conditions. Well, we know for a fact they've been creating these hurricanes because the way hurricanes been acting, they ain't never done what they've been doing. That's dancing in the damn Atlantic Ocean, hovering over Atlantic Ocean, just sitting there, then doing a beeline. So they're openly giving you the truth and the lies at the same time, telling you that they can and they will create monster hurricanes. And it's not to save lives. It's for Agenda 21 depopulation. All your FEMA 
camps, all your Walmart shutting down, all these other stores shutting down, being used for uh, holding centers for the victims, homeless people coming up missing, all the victims coming up missing out of the shelters. Let's watch this video. Atlantic hurricane season enters day two. Forecasters predict fewer storms this year, but they also warn a quiet season can produce a devastating hurricane. Mark Strassman is in Miami, where researchers are creating their own storms in a state-of-the-art lab. It could end up saving lives. Mark, good morning. Good morning. This tank gives scientists... I'd like to pause it right there and ask... What lives have they saved? I ain't seen no lives, so you, they said that making all this, doing all this recreation of hurricanes and to save lives, but they ain't saved no lives. They've, they've caused more lives to be taken than anything. And the rest of us, a view no one has ever had before. What a hurricane's power looks like at water level as it storms ashore. In just two minutes, Scientists here can take calm waters and turn them into a monster hurricane. The wind is gradually getting stronger and stronger as, it, as it's coming up here and it's ramping up to a category five. It's probably about a category three right now. This 75 foot long tank is the first simulator in the world capable of creating a category five hurricane over water. Brian House is the director of the University of Miami's new laboratory at the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. What was it like when you cranked it up the first time? Full it was, it was uh, stunning. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was chill. Nearly 40,000 gallons of seawater fill this tank. House uses a computer program and a single 1,700 horsepower fan with wind speeds up to 157 miles per hour. This tank is... The, the largest wind wave facility in the world. We can generate a, an extreme Category 5. House and his team want to understand why some hurricanes make landfall and fizzle out, while others become catastrophes. It's the heat of the ocean that powers the hurricane. We know that gasoline drives a car, but if you didn't know how much you were pouring into the, into the engine, you wouldn't know how fast it's going to go. What this is going to help teach you is how the gasoline gets into the engine of the hurricane. Exactly. Their focus is storm surge. Rising waters historically. Their focus is Agenda 21, depopulation and flooding out mass areas with high population and low uh, income or poor people. That's what they're, that's their target, their first targets cause nine out of ten hurricane related deaths during hurricane katrina in 2005 storm surge killed 1500 people dr rick knapp director of the national hurricane center in miami has high hopes for if the new they can create a hurricane that means it tells me they can steer the hurricane which tells me that the weather ships that long crow has been pointing out is uh a fact i mean they're telling us blankly and openly that they know how to create storms which means and explains how they've been steering them and explains how they've been sitting and hovering over the Atlantic and then all of a sudden veering off. Cane hunters have flown into storms and dropped probes to gauge its intensity. Research like this in a laboratory is one of the critical pieces we need to perhaps lead to more accurate forecast warnings. Gut level tell you this thing will be life safer. We are going to find some some things that are going to change the way we forecast hurricanes and because we can do it better we can save lives they can do it better they ain't saving no lives what they're saying when he's saying they can do it better is they can create their own hurricanes better that way they don't sizzle out so that they can flood the mass population i'm standing out on the roof of the tank below me the hurricane is growing loud Published on September 1st, 2017, news reporter openly admits weather machine. Listen.
once again, sort of that, that perfect hurricane machine, very symmetrical. You have that perfect. Okay. That perfect hurricane machine, very symmetrical. That perfect hurricane machine, very symmetrical. That perfect hurricane machine, very symmetrical. You have that hurricane, center and hurricane machine. It is moving to the west at about 13 miles. I didn't miles say it, she did. Most Americans are unfortunately completely unaware of the long and dark history of the U.S. military's abuse of the Puerto Rican population and the environment on which their lives depend. Is Puerto Rico's refusal to be sprayed with dangerous neurotoxins under the guise of mosquito abatement in the past, toxins that are now being sprayed on Texas and Florida, was their refusal to allow this another factor in making them a target for weather warfare? Rico, was it another factor that somehow played in the overall weather warfare agenda that's being carried out? And here's what's not speculation. Hurricane Maria, like Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Harvey, could have been dissipated with patented processes of cyclone suppression, just as been the case with so many other Atlantic basin storms in recent history, over 4,300 days. But they weren't. These storms were not only allowed to spin up to full strength, they were steered and manipulated. And what about Hurricane Jose, the storm that just won't go away?
people here, they're Jamaican, they're um, British, American, they're all kind of military people with guns by the way. So if you slip up, don't get shot. This phenomenon that we're witnessing is actually a, a natural evolution. And any time you organize human beings to come together to use violence as a way of conflict resolution, you will have a breakdown of that organization. Peace is not a political process, and it's certainly not a militaristic. Our real enemies are not in some distant land. They're not people whose names we don't know and cultures we don't understand. The enemy is people we know very well and people we can identify. The enemy is a system that wages war when it's profitable. The enemy is the CEOs who lay us off from our jobs when it's profitable. It's the insurance companies who deny us health care when it's profitable. It's the banks who take away our homes when it's profitable. Our enemy is not 5,000 miles away. They are right here at home. And if we organize and fight with our sisters and brothers, we can stop this war, we can stop this government, and we can create a better world. 